So we're going to read Psalm 8 and then sing all of Psalm 8, and I hope that will kind of put it into our memories together, that uh, as you go out into the week, that you will reflect upon it and uh, be filled with the joy and the wonder of it. It's a beautiful summer psalm as well. So Psalm 8 has the heading to the choir master according to Giddith. We don't know what that exactly means. And then we have there a psalm of David. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you were mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands and you have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Beloved congregation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we love to sing, don't we? I think it's one of the problems we're having with the mask and that whole thing to sing, to sing the praises of God. But it's one thing to sing them, and then it's another thing to actually understand what we're singing. So anybody can say, Lord, our Lord in all the earth, how great is your name? I remember once watching the Messiah, the Handel, and uh, the soloist was uh, a woman from um, another uh, sexual background, let's say, singing the, the praises of Almighty God. And, and you wonder, when she stands before God on the judgment day, you were singing the words of the Bible, and yet you don't live in What does that even mean? But then what does it mean for us when we sing it? I mean, we, we still like the tunes, but the words... Lord, our Lord, and all the earth, how majestic is your name. I wonder if it's lost a little bit on the church today. I know the, the, one of the strengths of the Canadian Reformed Church is, is your view of the covenant, covenant theology. Maybe we over-speak it, sometimes at the expense of the gospel in the, in, in the worlds of ministers and theologians. But there's something important here for you all, that, that the reason, especially for the children, we spend time talking to you about it, is so that you can understand these psalms. Lord, our Lord, and all the earth, Right? And what is a covenant? So a covenant really is a relationship between God and his people. And God says, I am your God. He said to the Israelites, I got you out of the land of Egypt. He comes to you and he says, I saved your parents and you children. You were baptized and I make a covenant with you. And if you believe in me, I will save you. And then we cry out, Lord. Lord, our Lord. Now the reason I'm talking about covenant is now, if you have your Bibles open, you have, it's interesting, isn't there, in, in verse 1, O, and then capitals, L-O-R-D, our Lord, capital L, but then small, L-O-R-D. And I wonder if it's time to just simply put Yahweh, I don't know if that's the best translation, I take mine from R.C. Sproul, Yahweh is the Hebrew name I am. It is, it is basically, um, I have some friends who says, yeah, I is what I is, but it is a, a, a verb that's made into a name. And maybe we should use it because really what we're saying there is Yahweh, oh Yahweh our master. And wouldn't that speak a little bit better than Lord our Lord? So that name, Yahweh, I am, or the great I am, God gave to Moses. So Moses says, look, I've got to go to these people and they're in bondage and, and they're in Egypt and they don't really know you anymore. How are they going to know who sent me? Who should I say sent me? And then God in, in a burning bush said to Moses, say that I am sent me. And it's a really amazing name, right? Because it means that God always is, always was, always will be. How long was God there before he created the earth? The answer, of course, is Yahweh, I am. Jesus would take up that name himself before Abraham was, I am, proving that he was God, using the name of God, which is why the Pharisees got so angry with him. 
And God says, I am independent. I don't ask for anybody's advice. I don't ask for anybody's counsel. Here I am. And I made the heavens, and I made the earth, and I made you, and you can know me. And I am your Lord. I am your master. Now, in our day and age of liberty, what does liberty even mean? Can you really have full liberty in a world and live together? No. You have to give up some freedom. But we say, no, we give up all freedom of ourself to live as slaves owned by Jesus Christ, owned by Almighty God, because in him we find joy and the wonder of salvation. I mean, think of it this way. If we would take a little baby and we would take that little one, say, sitting at the back and just just leave him here to be free to do whatever he wants to do and just go home, what's going to happen to him? He's not free to live. He's not free to prosper. He's not free to grow up in the fear of the Lord unless he is in the possession of his parents. And that's what God does. He says, look, you're weak. You're slaves. You're in bondage. I am going to do all of this for you. And I, who am the greatest power in all the universe, I make myself known to you and you can know me and I will take care of you. And when we begin to unfold that and unpack that, we say, of course, how how majestic How great, how glorious is his name in all the earth. Or you could just simply say, how great thou art. You see, back then, all politics was covenantal. So normally what happened is a king would roll into your country, and he'd defeat you. I mean, he'd beat you bad. And then he would say, do you want to live? If you want to live, you better pay taxes to me. If you want to be free, you better obey my laws. If you don't want me to take your children and your wives and everything else, you better obey me. It was based on fear. It was based on dominance. It was based on tyranny. And how does God come? Completely differently. So that even David the king says, my Lord, my master is Yahweh, the great I am, the Lord. He understands God. Really, Psalm 23 sings about it. The Lord is my shepherd. He's a father. He feeds me. He takes care of me. He washes me. And then, or rather, he's a shepherd. And then he's a father. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemy. My cup overflows. Who has a king like we have a king? Who has a God like we have a God? How majestic is your name in all the earth? And then he comes to you this morning and says, I want you to reveal my glory in all the earth. So, you know, sometimes, how do we do evangelism? Well, here's an easy way. Walk around this week and just say, Lord, my Lord, in all the earth, how great is your name in all the earth? And if somebody asks you about it, you should really sing it too. So you want to sing it with me? Or if you're not such a good singer, then just say it. Think about what that means to tell people who you are. What, what, if, what if Trudeau and Trump and Ford and the whole Supreme Court would say this this morning with us? What would Canada look like? It would, still wouldn't be perfect because they're imperfect men. But boy, if we can acknowledge this God who comes to us in grace and mercy, everything changes. So God is going to use you. The Lord reveals himself through the church singing of his royal glory. First we'll see God's glory over the enemy. So we sing those first two verses of Psalm 8. Then we'll move into the next part. God's glory in all of the creation and what that means. And especially the creation of man. And then especially at the end, his glory through humanity himself. Lord, our Lord, and all the earth, how majestic is your name. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babies and infants you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. You have set your glory above the heavens. When you look up in the sky, when you see it, how can you not see the marvel of God? As I drove here this morning, it felt like God was seriously just dumping buckets of rain on the highway. It, there was like floods this bad. It was uh, God's mercy that I'm here today, and I shouldn't have pushed as hard as I did. But, wow, it was spectacular. Or when you think of the blues on a beautiful summer day, and we've had lots of those. Some would say maybe too many of them. We needed the rain. But who makes a blue like that? Like even when you see a painting of it or a, a photo of it, 
It's still only a copy of it. It, it, It's only an impression of it. God thought of it. God made it. And yesterday, I was just kind of thinking about the sermon and and looking up into the skies. And and you get those beautiful, soft, billowy clouds. And they're just rolling. And then they kind of group together. And then all of a sudden, the sun is blocked. But it's not, is it? Because even when the, the clouds block the sun, I could still read my book. I could still do whatever I needed to do. And you look up into the heavens, and then do you ever get that when when the sun, it just seems like it's burning out of the cloud, and it's just that light is rolling out of the side? Or sometimes when you have that cloudy day, and then there's that little break, and then you see all those rays of heaven, and you feel like if you could just shoot through that hole in the clouds, you could go to be with God. Maybe we have that more as kids, I don't know. I hope we don't lose the wonder of it as adults too because it is spectacular Romans 1 tells us or Psalm 19 Psalm 8 God's talking to you through this God's revealing himself so that you can sing about this the heavens declare the glory of God when we look up to your heavens O Lord all we can say is Lord our Lord in all the earth how great is your name and then when we look beyond it we think God is there and beyond. They're talking about that there are are more solar systems than even our own. That there's more constellations than we even know about. How how big is space? How, How awesome is it? And God is there and beyond it. You think, for those of us who remember when the cosmonauts, the Russians, the atheists, went up into heaven and they laughed. They said, well, we've been up here, haven't seen God yet. How foolish. And it is an interesting thing, isn't it? How come when you look at the heavens and you see the clouds and you see the birds up there and you see the blues or you see a, the, the thunderbolts and, and, the, and the black angry clouds and the rain coming, how come we see God and so many in Canada don't? That, that's a remarkable thing, isn't it? And it can't just be because we're brighter than everybody else. I mean, it's a marvelous thing. So we're looking at these young people here, right in the front, right? God made the earth, right? How come there's people with PhDs that teach university and they don't know and you know? It's because God gave you this, this knowledge. That's how come we know. That's how come your parents know. The only reason we know is because God gives us the Holy Spirit and the Word because we would know the heavens declare the glory of God till the Bible was given to us. So now God says, I want you, beloved congregation of Redeemer, to tell the world what that cloud, what that sky, what that sun, what all of that's about is revealing my glory. That's why I'm telling you because if I didn't tell you, you would just think, oh, well, it's just natural law. Or the clouds are there because of the cooling of the mists and the rain. Or the blues are there because of the fragmentation of light that creates a blue because it's not actually blue, just like the ocean's not actually blue. It's just reflecting the blue of the sky. They got all kinds of answers, and they got nothing. (laughs) What's interesting is one of the fastest growth rates of faith in God, or sometimes we call that theism, not necessarily Christianity, but a belief in God, is people who are studying science. Because the more they study science, they're convinced this didn't just happen. Right? If you found this watch in a forest somewhere, you wouldn't just say, wow, isn't that cool? Mother Nature, just with all the forces here in the, forces, in the forest, put together a watch. Somebody made the watch. Everybody knows somebody made the watch. And for this creation to happen, for you to happen as we, we get to that, They say that that the probability of us going from a big bang to a human being, and think about your hand, just think about your hand, because they can't reproduce it. They don't understand how how this can control all of that. That the odds of that happening are the same thing as a wind whipping through a junkyard and putting together a perfect 747 that could fly. That's called impossible. That's science? That's not science, that's faith. They don't have faith, beloved. That's the difference. That's why God's coming to you this morning. You know me. You know what I've done for you. You know what I've done for you in Jesus Christ. I've come to you, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, you know I made all of these things. And that's why you sing, oh, Lord, my God, how great thou art. 
and the rustling grass, I hear him pass. He speaks to me everywhere. This is my father's world. And then he goes from the, from the vast to the small, to the little ones. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you've established strength because of your foes. To still the enemy and the avenger. What does that mean? It's kind of an interesting juxtaposition, right? Where you go to this broad, the heavens declare the glory to, to children. To babies. How do babies, how do children declare the glory of God? How do they silence the foe? Well, there's a couple of ways to understand it. One is just when out of the mouth of babes. So you remember the story of Naaman, big Syrian general, second in command probably in a a very powerful empire, and he gets leprosy and nobody can heal him. But there's a little girl. That little girl is a Jewish girl, and she's in that house because Israel has been disobedient. The parents have been disobedient. But somehow this little girl knows God. And she says to her mistress, Oh, if only my master would go to see the prophet who is in Israel, Elisha, and he would be healed out of the mouth of babes. Or remember when Jesus came into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday? Who was singing the Hosannas? The little children. There is that hymn, right? Hosanna loud, Hosanna. The little children sang. And the Pharisees are saying, shut them up. We don't want to hear about this. Jesus says, really? You think I'm going to stop them singing the glory of God? Hosanna? God saves us? Wow. Out of the mouth of babes. I remember when my sister died. My sister died pretty tragically in a car accident. And we were all sitting there and pretty sad. And then my cousin came in. I don't think he was eight years old. Don't really remember. I just remember him being little, walking in and going, what's wrong? Isn't Sonia in heaven? Yeah. Isn't she happy there? Yeah. Well, then why are you all crying? And we all just out of the mouths of babes. It's simple. It's pure. It's clear. They don't ask all the why questions. They just simply say that's what it is. But I think there's more, and Calvin helps us with this. So one of the blessings that you have in this congregation is children. And that children are being baptized. And I know sometimes we long for that. We would love to see more adult baptisms, and we'd love to see more people coming in from the outside, and that's good. Keep those hopes up and keep working at it. But don't minimize The baptism. Don't minimize that every year you have a number of young people making profession of faith. That's not us. That's not because we put up our Christian schools and teach such great catechism. That has to be the Lord. Because if it's on us, then every child that doesn't believe, that's on us too. That's God here. That's God ordaining strength. And you know what he's saying? Devil, you can't stop us. You're not getting our children. They belong to Almighty God, and he keeps raising them up. And every time you try to stop them, another generation comes. And every time you try to take them away, we stand up, and the Lord blesses us. Every generation of those children, every young boy back then receiving circumcision, every child receiving the mark of baptism even today, is a declaration of war on the enemy. What does Psalm 127 say? Lo, children are a heritage from the Lord. Arrows in the hands of a warrior are sons born in one's youth. The arrows are the understanding that they are soldiers, that we're raising children to defend us when the enemy comes. What happens when you pass away? Well, hopefully our generation will continue. But what happens when we pass away? Well, then we're looking to you, and then we need you to take care of us. And little children, you don't have to wait for profession of faith, and don't wait forever to make profession of faith. Make your profession of faith and tell the world, Because children are part of the kingdom of God. And out of the mouths of babes, Satan can't even stop the children. And ultimately, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ becomes that child, the child, the one who gets born from a virgin, born in Bethlehem, Herod's after him, the devil's after him, read Revelation chapter 12, but he overcomes, God provides for him, God even sends him back to Egypt redeems him out of Egypt so that Jesus Christ can, as a baby, grow up and be a man. There's Jesus Christ. Unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government of the world is on that baby's shoulders. Satan 
enemies, demons, devil, the world. Look at our children. You can't stop us because you can't stop God. Look at Jesus in that manger. You cannot stop the power of God. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And then he goes further into the creation, our second point. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers. Now we're back into the heavens again because it's so amazing. Notice it doesn't say the work of your hands. It says the work of your fingers. It's a little thing, but it's a really interesting thing because it has to do with art. It has to do with a potter who's shaping the clay. He's making something. She's making something out of this lump that becomes beautiful, a vase or a statue even, or the idea of someone embroidering, or someone putting a quilt together, or someone painting. When I look at the art that is your world, oh Lord, how great you are. I mean, maybe do this at home. Draw an animal that's never existed. We used to do that at Vacation Bible School. We would have the kids come in, draw an animal that doesn't exist. And what they do is they draw parts of animals that exist and join them together. Or they draw something from anime or something ridiculous that I don't know about. But they can only draw from what they know. You realize that, right? Creativity in human beings can only be from that which is already created. Our imagination is, we're limited. We're people. But God thought of the peacock, and then he made it. God thought of the cardinal, and then he made it. We have falcons returning back. Where my mom and dad live just in Niagara, the bald eagles are back. God thought of it, and he made it. We've already talked about the human hand. But look around you. And I don't mean just look around you. Do you like that person or not like that person? God made that person. That's a remarkable thing. All of us together. And if you think about all of us, seven billion on the earth, all looking up into the heavens of God and all being talked to, And then we know that God has made this and made us. When I look at the heavens, when I look at the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place. What is man that you are mindful of him? We have an artist in our church and he he painted a canvas. It's just about seven feet tall and it's about four feet wide. And then he painted an up north sky. I have to say this, having moved to Toronto, when you look up into the sky at night, like sometimes you can see well over two stars. And I think when God came to Abraham and said, now look up there, you'll have that many descendants. I would have, in Toronto, we'd all go, that's impressive. <laughs> but then you go up north, and the best, right, is when you're on the lake and you're just out swimming and you look up and you go, oh, you don't even know where to start and to finish to count them all. And it's brilliant, and God knows every single one of them and how they move and the wonder of it. So this man in our church went up to Algonquin, and he, he did the rough sketches for a painting, and he painted this, this seven-by-four-foot canvas. And from, from basically two inches all the way up is the sky, and then way in the corner, he just has this little person, honestly, about this big, just going like this, and then he has Psalm 8 there. And that, that's the sense of it, how puny we are when we look up into the sky. Wow. And then he comes to us in that creation and and we think, Lord God, why do you even care about us? And the sense is there that why did you create us? Why why are you mindful of us? So kind of behind Psalm 8 is Genesis 1 and 2. Right, Genesis 1, the creation, and then I will give man dominion over the earth and I will give him the image of God and the creation of man out of the creation from the dust of the earth and then Eve from out of Adam. It's really beautiful. It's a remarkable story. You don't ever lose the story. And then we think of him being a little lower than the angels and and all of that. And and, and we know that. Lord God, why? Because it's not just David saying, why do you care for all of us? It's why do you bother with me? When I think about what I do, when I think about the way I treat my wife or the way I yell at my kids or the way I drive sometimes, the way I drive a lot, Why does God even care for me? Do you ever have that? When you just look up into a night sky and go, Lord, my God, I'm so utterly insignificant, and yet you, I am, are my master, and you love me. And do you see how this rolls into evangelism? You just have to talk about your experience of God, your story. 
your experience, your emotions about God. The sheer of, wow, I'm alive today. I've been created. How can you be mindful of us, Lord God, that we're even recreated, that we're born again? And then you think of all those other creatures, those human beings, and don't we need to start thinking about that? Are we mindful of them? You know, when we fall into sin, in the day you eat of the fruit, you will be like God, right? We're just really horrible at being God. Because our God is utterly unselfish. And all of us, when we're God, we are completely selfish. My job, my house, my family, our Christian school, our church, me, 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 I, 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 R, 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 we, we, we. And then the poor fellow who's looking up at the stars going, wow, I wonder who made all this. Yeah, God did, and we just walk on by. Are we mindful of them? And you see that ultimately, right, again in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, for himself, had no reason to become a human, to become a creature. His, his physical body was created for him. And he did it for us. Mindful of us. To take on that weakened flesh so that he could die on the cross, suffer, be forsaken. Oh my God, why are you mindful of me? If the heavens declare it, then certainly the word of God declares it. And if the heavens are declaring it, and the word of God is declaring it, and our children are declaring it, then we best declare it. Oh Lord, how majestic is your name. How great thou art. And who is this man? Our last point. It has to do with dominion, right? I give man dominion over all the earth. Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings. So man is not angel. He's simply human. Angels can't die. Human beings can die. God had the angels. You ever think about that? Why didn't God just cut his losses? Why bother with us? But from before the foundation of the world, he decided to create us and to recreate us, to save us and redeem us. And you didn't give the angels dominion over the earth. You gave human beings over the, You crowned him with glory and honor. In the beginning, God created man in his image. True righteousness and holiness. Ephesians 4 and Colossians 3 tells us, the catechism makes that clear to us, that we may rightly know God, that we may do the things of God, that we may worship God in everything that we do. That's how we were created. But we lost it. We fell into sin with Adam and Eve. They wanted to be their own God. They wanted a covenant, be in relationship with the tyranny of the devil. And we see the mess that that's made in all the earth. All these men who think that they're crowned with glory and honor because they crowned themselves. Think of Nebuchadnezzar walking around Babylon. Oh, look what I have built. He didn't say, oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name. Oh, that Trudeau and Trump and Ford would, would say that. That it belongs to you, Lord God. That you crowned us. And we threw away the crown. But now by the power of God and through the power of the Holy Spirit, we sing Psalm 8 in the newness of Christ, in the full understanding that the image of God is being restored in us. That we are being made after the image of Jesus Christ. That all of you were baptized into his death, are raised anew into his life. Shall we go on sinning that grace may abound? By no means. We're going to live lives of pleasing love and service to this almighty God. And then God sends Jesus Christ so that he will have dominion again. Jesus Christ is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. That's why really our national anthem, I love it that it says God keep our land glorious and free. But shouldn't we say God in Christ keep our land? Because the Muslim can sing that too, and the Orthodox Jew can sing that too, and the Hindu can sing it as well. But we understand Christ is the king of Canada. Christ has dominion. Christ shall have dominion over land and sea. Earth's remotest region shall his empire be. He's got it back for us. What is man that you are mindful of us? And then he sends Jesus Christ who now with his bride, his new Eve, the church of Jesus Christ is being fruitful and multiplying. Good works are being done all over the world today and the church is growing in number 
and it will continue until Jesus Christ has ruled everything, as 1 Corinthians 15 tells us. He'll bring the kingdom into its fullness, and then he'll hand the kingdom back to God, and then God is going to hand it back to all of us. So that, And how does that work? With all the people who have been saved, how many is that? And we will all together, in perfect harmony with Jesus Christ, rule the new heavens and the new earth. Do you ever think about that? If Adam and Eve had dominion over the earth, and then Cain and Abel were born before the fall, how do four people have dominion of the earth perfectly together? It's unthinkable for us, isn't it? But that is going to happen again. Oh, Lord. What a future, what a, what a glory that awaits us. And then David sees the yes and amen in all this. I am the king of Israel. I see this in a very practical way. And think about that elders who are going to be installed, elders who are serving. This church is not your church, it's Christ's church. You rule for him, and he lifts you up. He's mindful of you. And the office bearers, deacons together, pastors, all of us together as we begin to understand that, and then husbands and fathers and parents. And then when that all begins to work and then we live our lives under the grace and mercy that is in Jesus Christ, when we confess his name, when we find our yes and amen in the new image bearing that we have in Jesus Christ, then we end where we begin the sheep, the oxen, the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea, we are now going to rule over that with Jesus Christ so that the earth and all people, our hope would be, would say, oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic, how awesome, how excellent is your name in all the earth. So where we started, we're calling the earth. And we end in all the earth. Go, therefore, into all the world, into all the earth, and teach them about the Lord. Who he is, what he's done, who you are, what he's done for you, and who you are now. And if you have to sing it with a mask on, then just articulate it better. But don't let the mask shut us up. And you children, grow in grace and knowledge. And remember who you are. God has given you to us so that the enemy's mouth may be stopped, basically so that he will be quiet. And this is your God, beloved. This is the hope that we have, that we can sing to his glory and to his honor how great thou art. Amen.